Hi everybody and welcome back to our vlog series. My name is Alexander Stremitz and I'm the professor for law, economics and business at ETH Zurich. Traditional economic theory has at its core a behavioral model, a model of human behavior that um, describes how people would act under certain circumstances. Usually this model assumes that people love money, they hate to work, and they exhibit superhuman degrees of rationality. Now, experiment after experiment has shown that this model does not often accurately describe what humans actually do. And so the program of behavioral law and economics has been to try to improve this model of human behavior. And this has succeeded in achieving more accurate descriptions, but what is not so known is that it also leads to a lot of problems when we try to formulate policy. And there's a very deep conceptual problem, and that is that if we don't have traditional views of human preferences, it becomes very difficult to know what people actually want. And if we try to develop legal policy, or if we just try to develop institutions that serve the interest of people, and we just don't not, uh, we don't not uh, want to, to just predict what people do, but we want to create something that's in their interest, we have to have a sound way to find out what people actually want. And it turns out that this is actually quite difficult um, in the framework of behavioral law and economics. Now, Daniel Markowitz is the Guido Calabresi Professor of Law at Yale Law School um, and one of the most prominent legal theorists. And in a new paper, uh, which he presented at ETH yesterday, uh, he claims that behavioral law and economics leads to a de facto paternalism in which a small elite group of economic experts impose their distorted views on the rest of us. And uh, he proposed uh, methods uh, or an approach how we could democratize behavioral economics. Daniel, welcome to the CLE. Thanks so much for having me, Alex. It's a real pleasure to be here. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in this topic? Sure. Um, I am a philosopher by training as well as an economist, really more of a philosopher. And uh, a colleague of mine, Zach Liskow, uh, who has written this particular paper with me, and I started talking about behavioral economics and about what we saw as a mismatch between the enormous descriptive successes of behavioral economics, uh, the ways in which behavioral studies again and again and again show that they're better able to predict what actual people will do in actual circumstances than formal classical models could do. And on the one hand, that's a success. And on the other hand, um, there was sort of a mismatch between that success and the sort of naivete of the behavioralists about thinking that they could make policy based on these descriptions. Because it's one thing to describe behavior, it's another thing to say what would be a good thing in the world. And we thought you needed very different ideas in order to say what would be a good thing. And so we started thinking about, well, how did traditional economics do this? How does behavioral economics have to behave differently in order to be able to continue to make solid recommendations for policy? And what is basically your argument? What's the difference between uh, traditional economics and behavioral law and economics? So maybe one way to think about it is this. Um, behavioral scientists sometimes talk about humans and econs. So econs are perfectly rational. Uh, they may want very different things, but it's a feature of being an econ that whatever you want, you'll make the choice that will maximize your getting what you want subject to the constraints that you face. Uh, so you'll make yourself as well off as you can be, and your choices will be freely yours. Humans, on the other hand, aren't like that. 
we make all kinds of mistakes. So we often want something, but then we make choices which won't get us what we actually want. And our behavior doesn't actually maximize our well-being. We see this all the time in life, that people make what seem to us to be mistakes. In addition, we're manipulable so that other people, advertisers, states, politicians, can transform how we behave in ways that are not in our own interests. And so the question we asked ourselves is, if we're dealing with humans, how can you know what policies you should make to serve the real interests of humans rather than econs? So uh, how can we use these advances that were made by behavioral economics and still formulate policy that is in the interest of ordinary people? Well, let's take a concrete example. Um, imagine uh, that I like the taste of donuts, but I also want to be healthy. So if I'm an econ, I'll eat exactly the optimal number of donuts so that the value I get from tasting them is exactly equal to the disvalue I get on the margin from their being bad for me, and then I'll stop. Of course, if I'm a human, I'm not like that. I may eat way too many donuts and have too little health. Or in the other direction, I may become compulsive about my health and never eat donuts, even though they wouldn't harm me very much if I have just one, and I'd really love the taste. So what classical economics could do is it could piggyback on the rationality of econs and to say, as long as there's no monopoly in the donuts market, as long as we have regulations that make sure that the seller of donuts reveals to the buyer what's in them and what their health effects will be, We'll just let the buyer decide how many to eat. But once we're dealing with humans, we need to figure out, well, for this imperfect person, how is it that they can determine what the right number of donuts to eat is? What behavioral economists have mostly done is they've assumed that they know the answer to this question. They've assumed that they can tell imperfect humans how many donuts they should eat. And then they've asked, how should we manipulate humans? in order to make them eat the right number of donuts? Should we maybe place a tax on donuts? Should we maybe make it difficult to park near the donut store so that you have to walk further, which is just another kind of tax, it's a time tax? Should we forbid donuts because they're so bad for you and people have such weak will that they'll just eat themselves to death? And what Zach and I thought is, well, how do the economists know what the right number of donuts is to eat? After all, it's a difficult question. And economists are not like other people. They have certain demographic backgrounds. They have certain training. They're not representative of the population. So maybe what we should do instead is use behavioral insights to help people learn to overcome their own biases. And in particular, we should teach people about their biases. So don't tell somebody how many donuts they should eat, but tell somebody, you know, probably when you see the donut store and the smell of the donuts is really good, you're going to improperly discount the health effects and you'll regret how many donuts you ate. And once we've told people this and shown the pattern of behavior, now say to them, knowing what you know now, how would you decide how many donuts to eat? And so the idea is to empower people to overcome their irrationalities rather than to use their irrationalities to regulate people and tell them what to do. But when I, if I understand you correctly, you don't only want to teach people about their biases, you also want to elicit their true preferences. So what would be specifically the procedure, the kind of the polling procedure that you have in mind? So the thing Zach and I have in mind is that we would get a bunch of people together who are representative of the general population and we'd give them access to experts about their own behavioral proclivities. And this sounds a crazy thing to do about eating donuts, but the example we use in the paper is retirement savings, which is a much more important question. And so what we do is we get a representative sample of the population that's saving for retirement, and we would get them in a room and we'd say, would you like to learn from behavioral economists? Would you like to learn from psychiatrists? Would you like to learn from sociologists? About how people actually save. Some people save too much, some people don't save enough, some people regret that they haven't saved enough, other people wish they'd spent more when they were younger. And we teach people about these patterns in their own behavior. And then we'd say to them, now knowing everything you know about the way in which you will tend to behave, what do you think the right way for you to behave is? Which is not the same question as how would you behave before you knew about your own biases. In that way, uh, it's a little bit the economist as psychotherapist. We would try to do consciousness raising about behavioral effects 
in order to empower people m more effectively to satisfy their true interests. Mm -hmm. But couldn't, couldn't a skeptic um, argue that you are merely um, replacing the paternalism of the economists with the paternalism of a group of anti-bias coaches that uh, bring people into particular moods and um, then derive their supposed true preferences. Um, and, and to make it particularly stark, you could imagine that these preferences are then um, recited back to these people after they have been in this kind of esoteric mood and they would outrightly reject them as something that would uh, curb their spontaneity or what they feel like doing at the moment. So what's your response to that? Yeah, yeah. so first of all, uh, it's, a, it's a good challenge and there's always a question about what's the difference between education and indoctrination. Um, I think the kind of education that we want to give is especially resistant to this problem, but not perfectly so. So let me explain why. Um, traditional debiasing education tells people this is what's actually in your interest. So it says to somebody, this is the optimal rate for you to save. And here's the reason why. And so it tries to teach people to believe what the expert thinks is the truth about how much they should save. There you obviously have a huge problem, which is the experts can pick their own truth and they're indoctrinating people to pursue whatever ends the experts think are the right ones. What we're trying to do instead is to say, look, we don't know what the right amount to save is. But what we do know is that people, including us and including you, have the following patterns in how they save and how they feel about it. We know, for example, that certain kinds of people save a lot when they're young, and then when they're old, wish that they'd had a more happy life when they were young. And other kinds of people spend all their money and then 10 years hence really regret what they did. And these are the features of the people in each kind of category. And think about yourself, which one do you fall into? What regret do you think you will have? And now, in the shadow of knowing this thing about yourself, what do you think you should do? Now, obviously, it's possible that we'll just be imposing a new set of biases by this. But notice, we're not trying to teach people the right answer. What we're trying to do is teach people how to be self-conscious and self-critical and to empower them. And that kind of empowerment education is less likely to be a form of indoctrination than traditional education is. Nothing is perfect in the world, but we think that this approach is a better one. Mm -hmm. Now, um, as a philosopher, you've um, kind of educated us in your, in your talk about how this really is um, a, a different frame of thinking, the traditional way of thinking um, of uh, kind of traditional economists um, being more a Kantian way of thinking, whereas what you propose is more Hegelian way of thinking. Could you maybe explain this in simple words sure. to our viewers? So look, uh, if I have a bias, one way to think about what a bias is, is a way in which my judgments or my actions reflect something peculiar and contingent about me rather than something that is objectively true about the world. And the question is, how am I going to overcome my bias? And one way to overcome it is by purifying me of my biases, by stripping away every contingency about me so that what's left is pure rationality. The idea is you take away, to go back to the humans versus econs, you take away all the human weaknesses and you're left with an econ. And that's roughly speaking the way in which Kant thought about objectivity and freedom. Strip away biases and then what's left will be rationality and freedom. There's a very different way of doing it, which is to say, look, we can't do that. And we can't do that because we're all humans, not econs. And there's no place we can stand at in order to decide what to strip away. So maybe a better thing for us to do is to become self-reflective and self-conscious. And not to say, let's strip away everything that's human about us, but let me understand how I'm human and how my humanity leads me to engage in patterns of belief and behavior that maybe make me make mistakes, that maybe in the, I won't be so pleased with or I won't be so proud of it after the fact. And so by stepping back from myself and reflecting on my own nature, that's another way in which I can try to become debiased. But in a sense, it's a more modest way. It's a more human way. 
the thought is we can't make ourselves perfectly rational. What we can do is make ourselves self-aware about our irrationalities. And when we know about our own irrationalities, we will slowly approach a, a freer and more deliberative state. Thank you very much, Daniel, for sharing these insights with us. Thank you for having me. It's been a huge pleasure to be here, to be at the seminar, and to be speaking with you now. Really grateful for the chance. Well, and uh, thank you to our viewers. Um, thank you for being with us, and um, see you next time.